Good evening. I'm Karen Sander, Director of Public Programs for the CUNY Graduate Center. Welcome. For those of you who are not familiar with us, the Graduate Center is the primary PhD granting body of the CUNY system. Our campus is located in the heart of Manhattan on 34th Street and Fifth Avenue in a beautiful old building across the street from the Empire State Building. We miss seeing many of you in person and look forward to welcoming you back in our building on Fifth Avenue soon. We will also continue to engage with audiences who can't make their way to New York City and wanna join us virtually. Viewers have tuned in from 50 states and 40 countries to engage with our public events that give a smart and unique perspective on many of the critical issues of our time. So to all of you who are watching from New York City and from around the world, we are so glad that you're here with us tonight. Tonight's event is presented by the Graduate Center's Office of Public Programs and our Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality. The Stone Center engages in research, scholarship, and public outreach while educating the next generation of scholars on the critical topic of inequality. The Center brings forth ideas and solutions for how to lessen inequality and build more equitable structures in our society. Tonight's event examines how we build societies from the perspective of sci-fi authors and social scientists. Over the summer, when we were brainstorming topics for fall public events, it came up that at a recent Stone Center faculty and staff meeting, a big topic of conversation was what sci-fi books everyone was reading. Interesting. Why were these top economists, sociologists, and political scientists such sci-fi fans and so eager to discuss it with each other? Digging a little deeper into the topic, the connection became clear. Social scientists question and try to reimagine society through their research, as sci-fi writers do creatively through their stories. They are both world builders using similar and different tools. Tonight, we will look at that connection with a serious and light touch. Our format is as follows. First, Ada Palmer and Joe Walton will spend a little time discussing how they build new worlds in their stories. Then we will have a panel discussion. And for the last 10 minutes, there'll be an opportunity for questions from the audience, which you can start putting in the Q&A box uh, around 8.10. We will conclude our events at 8.30. And just a note, for those of you who might like to watch the program again or, or share it with a friend who couldn't attend, uh, the event video will be posted in a few days on the Graduate Center's YouTube channel, and we will send out an announcement to all of you with the link when the video is up. Now, let me introduce our panel. First, our two sci-fi writers, Ada Palmer and Joe Walton, who are together in the box. Uh, it's so nice to see two people together. <laughs> um, so let me tell you a little bit about each of them. Ada Palmer's Ter Tarot Ignato series explores a future of borderless nations and globally co-mixing populations. The first volume, Two Like the Lightning, was a Best Novel Hugo finalist and won the Compton Crook Award, while Ada received the Campbell Award. She teaches history at the University of Chicago, studying the Renaissance, Enlightenment, heresy, atheism, and censorship. She blogs at xurbe.com. Next, Joe Walton has published 14 novels, most recently Lent. She has also published three poetry collections, two essay collections, and a short story collection. She won the John W. Campbell Award for Best New Writer, the World Fantasy Award for Tooth and Claw, the Hugo and Nebula Award for, for Among Others, and many other awards as well. Now, our social scientists, Henry Farrell is a professor working on democracy and international affairs at Johns Hopkins University. He is the 2019 winner of the Friedrich Scheidel Prize for Politics and Technology and editor-in-chief of the Monkey Cage blog at the Washington Post. He works on a variety of topics, including democracy, the politics of the internet, and international and comparative political economy. Next, Noah Smith writes at his Substack. Noah Opinion. He has been a columnist for Bloomberg and other publications and an assistant professor of finance at Stony Brook University. He received his PhD in economics from the University of Michigan. And lastly, it's my pleasure to introduce Paul Krugman, who will lead the conversation tonight. 
Paul Krugman is a distinguished professor of economics at the Graduate Center and a senior scholar and core faculty member at the Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality. He is the author or editor of more than 25 books and 200 papers, and since 1999 has been a columnist for the New York Times. He was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2008, and he also identifies as a sci-fi nerd. Now I turn it over to you, Paul, and the panel. After all this time, I'm still forgetting to turn off the mute button. Hi, everybody. Um, I, since Karen did such a good job of introduction, I just would, well, let, let me uh, bring up uh, the connections of, of our, our uh, visiting uh, nerds and, and myself to science fiction in a bit, but maybe uh, I, I thought we could start with some remarks from uh, Ada and Joe about how you work and, and we can lead on, lead on from there. Sure. Please go at it. Yeah, I mean, uh, we were talking earlier today about how to talk about how world building works and that at the heart of it, both of us work on what might be called or do a lot of what might be called social science, science fiction, where one of the things we're thinking about isn't just what is the technology and its direct application, but what are the second order social consequences, political consequences, world changes that happen as a result of the technology, right? Yeah. So if so, yeah, uh, I was going to say Robert Heinlein said anybody could invent the automobile and write about there's an automobile, you can go faster. Uh, but the science fiction thing is thinking about the way that the automobile changed courting habits. In, you know, who could date and where? And, uh, you know, to use a historical example, the development of trains and bicycles Again, these are inventions that you could imagine, and they are things that you could write a, a, a story about there being an automatic you know, machine that goes fast between two places. But one of their big consequences was that women could travel safely for the first time, and it caused a huge surge in feminist organization and women's suffrage movements, which is a sort of a third order consequence of now travel is easier and more organized and centralized in a way that a portion of the population that couldn't access before can access. So a huge portion of this kind of world building is thinking through not just the primary result of the technology, but the secondary and tertiary results of a technology, how this affects people's daily lives and other kinds of questions like that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, John Brunner in uh, 1969, sat down and, and looked at, did the if this goes on thing? And he looked at the trends that he saw around in 1969, and he decided to extrapolate four of those trends into four different novels that would all be set 50 years ahead uh, of 1969, so 2010. Um, and uh, one was overpopulation, one was pollution, one was uh, computers. Uh, uh, shockwave rider in which he predicts the internet. Um, and one was uh, racial tensions in the US. And they're very different books, but they're sort of doing that and the, the second order consequences of all of those things in a interesting way. And that's, that's the kind of thing that social science, science fiction goes for. Mm -hmm. And, and a lot of it is about how does the whole world end up changing as a result of something on multiple, on very plural axes instead of just one. So, you know, to use a science fiction premise we're all very familiar with, let's imagine that we've just watched the first Jurassic Park film and we're like, okay, we have dinosaurs and we have the technology that produced the dinosaurs. Now it's time for coming up with a sequel. And you can do more dinosaurs, you know, just as my dad joked, the best possible sequel to Snakes on a Plane would be Snakes on Two Planes. <laughs> uh, but you can also do the version of the sequel where you're saying, okay, well, they're dinosaurs, but also the gene patching technologies that had to be developed to make the dinosaurs mean that at the same time, there's longevity and longevity extension, which is being distributed unequally among different countries. And that's causing 
political tension and it's making you know leaders who've been in office for 20 years stay in office for another 20 years. And it's also meaning that there's now sort of human genetic manip manipulation happening. And also it turns out that brontosauruses are really delicious and that's had a huge negative impact on the cattle breeding industry. And now there's huge political tensions between the cattle producers and others, which means that the oil industry is wrapped up into it because so many people own land that produces both cows and oil. And you can just think through all these secondary political tensions, social consequences that could be happening at the same time that there are also dinosaurs happening because you have the secondary and tertiary effects of the technology occurring, many of which just open really neat spaces for thinking about a new kind of society, a new kind of education, a new kind of profession that could exist, uh, dinosaur butcher as a new profession, uh, uh, are, are yeah. all the kinds of things that social science oriented science fiction will think about. Yeah. Uh, questions of, of transportation and the way that people live and the way that people meet each other and the way that people communicate. Mm -hmm. um, I usually use communication as an example of this, that if you're writing something set in the past, you know how people communicate because you can look it up and you can you can see when the penny post was invented you can see when people were uh, needing to send messengers you can see when the phone was invented when the internet was invented but when you're looking into the future you don't know what we're going to have how we're going to be communicating and what second order effects that's going to have what it's going to look like and there's nothing that looks worse in science fiction than using exactly today's thing set in the future. You'd actually be better going back to messengers than having people using Twitter exactly as Twitter in 50 years. That it needs to be renamed to feel, yeah. to feel different. It, it just needs to be a different thing because even in, even in 10 years, that'll feel passe. Because well, I mean, there was that great example where there was a, you'll remember which story it is, there's an astronaut who's arriving on a derelict spaceship and, and looking around in it, and it's all dark, so the astronaut pulls out her cell phone and, and turns the screen white to use the light to see by, and you can tell the exact moment when cell phones didn't have flashlights in them yet, <laughs> that that story had to have been written. Now, no one can anticipate automatically what new technologies are going to happen. Um, but, but, but it's uh, a question of, you know, just sitting back with whatever the premise is and then saying, how would that affect, you can almost have a Rolodex of things. How would that affect education? How would yeah. that affect uh, different countries becoming richer or poorer or population growing or shrinking faster? Uh, families. Yeah, families is a great one. How would that affect families? I was just looking at the science fiction film, um, Whatever Happened to Monday, which is a one of many dystopian overpopulation films, uh, which has the premise that you're only allowed to have one kid. And if you have more than one kid, you can raise the kid for a while, but then the kid has to be put in suspended animation. And if you just stop there and then start thinking, what are the neat possible secondary uh, things that could happen? Well, what if okay, you're raising some kids until they're seven and then they're going to wake up in the future. Wouldn't that kid need a different kind of education oh, from yeah. other kids? Wouldn't there be like different classes in school for the kids that are going to be future knots versus the kids that are not? And also within the family, there would be very interesting sibling tensions between the kid that knows that this kid is going to go into the pod and the kid that you know isn't going to go in the pod and the parents would have different attitudes toward them. And sometimes they might be extra super affectionate to that kid because they only have a limited time together. And other times they, uh, they might be sort of isolated because they're trying not to let themselves like that. Kid. There's so many nuances that you could get at just with a question of how you prepare a kid to go into a pod at Absolutely. the age of seven. Yeah. Um, all right, um, <laughs> to, to, to we're opening up in many directions. Let me actually, I, I thought maybe on a lead off here, um, it, it, since Henry, um, if people don't know, in addition to uh, the, the Monkey Cage blog, which is, is really important for understanding uh, events, um, that he was also very active with Crooked Timber, which is a very, very interesting, interesting intellectual blog and organized two symposia on the work of both of our 
authors here. And I just thought maybe Henry might want to talk about, it. if you have a question particularly, if, uh, to, to pose to either or both of them about something that came up. We had one, there was one symposium on your Terra Ignota books, Ada, and mm -hmm. another on the, the Dust City books from, from Joe. Yeah. Where, um, which are very nearly, they're almost pure social science fiction because there, there recently isn't a, much of a technology, a little bit there, but mostly it's kind of literally a deus ex machina that makes it happen, so. Um, but the robots are, are integral robots. to the questions yes. of what it means to be a sentient being. This is true. <laughs> so I guess I do have a question or, you know, and this is a traditional academic comment masquerading as a question, but one of the things that I think really strikes me about both of your books is Joe just said that you shouldn't have the present surviving into the future in an obvious way, but I, I also think that sometimes you can, you can have the present surviving into the future, but being reinterpreted and uh, yeah. used in completely different fashion. And here I think, yes, if I'm, I'm a, in addition to all of this other stuff, I'm an EU person, or at least used to be somebody who studied the European Union. And one of the great things in Ada's novels is you have this completely obscure part of the European Union called the Economic and Social Committee, which nobody pays any attention to right at <laughs> But in Ada's future, it becomes important because it fits in a different kind of way. So mm -hmm. I really think uh, uh, both of your books are really good at thinking about thinking about history in a dynamic fashion and also thinking about how, from a certain perspective, we're history and what kinds of things we might look like to the uh, future. Yeah to a future age. So if Ken McLeod's saying about history being the trade secret of science fiction is true, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you use history, uh, including the history of the present in complicated and interesting ways to uh, make us receive where we are? Yeah, I've written a lot of alternate history where I have used, you know, actual history and then had things go differently. In my novel, My Real Children, I've got two different versions of the, the second half of the 20th century, neither of them our history, uh, where, I, where I diverge the, uh, the paths. Uh, because history is extremely interesting <laughs> and full of cool things for 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 playing with. Um, yeah. Mm. Well, and uh, you know, people often say, "Isn't it odd being a historian and writing science fiction?" Because past and future are opposites, but nothing is more similar to the future than the past. It's a long period of time in which societies grow and change, and new technologies arrive and disseminate slowly and disrupt things. Uh, so there's no better preparation for writing science fiction. But I think to, to compare Joe's point about the Twitter being used in 10 years versus yours about the European Union appearing in my books after 450 years, uh, the key is to think hard about what types of things are dynamic and changing and what types of things are stable and tend to last over time. And also what types of things tend to be repurposed uh, because there are some kinds of institutions that tend to not stop and go away, but intend, tend instead to undergo sort of what we can call regulatory capture, where the institution is so useful that a different purpose is found for it uh, as things move forward. And that tends to be true of a lot of political institutions. So the example I love here is the Roman Senate. Right. So ancient Rome is an individual little tiny city state, very, very ancient Rome, and they have a Senate and then they have some reforms. And they have a slightly different Senate and then they start having an empire. Now the Senate is governing an empire and that gets unwieldy. So then they have emperors, but they still have a Senate. And at first, the Senate is the sort of, you know, semi legislative, but also primarily um, uh, bureaucratic you know, people with political experience who work for the emperor who run the bureaucracy and provide the secondary governors of it. Uh, but then you get to bad emperors and then the Senate is repurposed again to become the body and seat of resistance and the, the source of structures of opposition to the major power. This oscillates for a while. Eventually, as we're used to it, you know, Rome's emperor moves east. There aren't emperors there anymore. There's still a Senate. Uh, and even after the Goths come and what we would call the Western Roman Empire is gone, this, the Senate is still there in Rome. And, and here are Goths and they don't know how to run Rome. The Senate is like, we know how to run Rome. Would you like us to, to run Rome? Okay. So there's still a Roman Senate and there's still the same structures. Only now it's 
a city administration again, which it had been a millennium earlier. Uh, and, and this continues way into the Middle Ages when the popes are there and descendants of senatorial families are now the tools of resistance against the papacy, which is not a thing that had existed for the first many centuries of the existence of this institution. These kinds of things get reused because their very antiquity provides legitimacy. Just as we've seen monarchies in Europe change what they do and what they're for. And we've also seen the papacy and the Japanese emperor change you know, what they're used and what they're for and be enveloped uh, by larger governments so that they're now like the little mitochondrian inside the cell rather than being uh, an independent government. But they didn't go away, they get restructured. And you know, the future is gonna have a lot of old things in it. The question is thinking about what is dynamic and changing and what is likely to be there but repurposed in the future. Right. So, and so we can easily see that as technology shifts, Twitter will have a will have a successor. And that, that's very intuitive to us, which is why if I have my characters in 2450 interacting with Twitter, it feels weird. If I have them interacting instead with the European Union, it feels like, oh, interesting. Yeah, the European Union could could yeah. change shape like that. Except then we learn that the European Union includes Canada and Madagascar and the Philippines. <laughs> You're like, OK, I can see that. I can see the European Union being a thing that is this you know, complicated, it's the future, it's shifted and what it does and what it's for has shifted because it's been repurposed. So a lot of it is is thinking about what's dynamic and what's uh, stable and especially rewinding a little bit and asking as John Brunner was in, in that yeah. moment, what is changing right now, right? Because right now, for example, the family unit, the current family unit of, the current stock Western family unit of one married couple and kids atomized in a house. That's a very young family unit. That's only existed really as the ideal family unit since the middle of the 20th century. And there are a lot of difficulties with it. The fact that labor balances have changed and lots of women are working now mean that it's actually a very unstable family unit much, much larger and more plural family units with multiple generations in one household were the stable unit for a much longer period of time as were multi-family multi households. And so when I look at a science fiction future where it's still a married couple and their kids in a house, you know, the question is how does that stabilize? Because it's sure not stable right now. And you can say that it does. You can say that they develop great nanny robots that make it suddenly that you, this isn't a childcare crisis. <laughs> Uh, and can just work. Uh, or maybe they don't, but you know, this is the way we're colonizing asteroids and each asteroid can only produce through the tech they have enough oxygen for X many people. But it's much more reasonable to say, okay, well, you know, it has been changing. It's in an unstable state right now. It's likely to have changed further in future. What yeah. are ways it could change? What are plural different ways that it could take a new shape in the near future? Um, that kind of gets to something I was going to point out, which is um, I think that a lot of times in sci-fi, you come across things, and you, uh, you know, story elements, institutions, you know, imaginary futures, whatever. You think this doesn't possibly make sense. This makes no sense. But then you look at the present, you think, does the present make sense? Does any of this stuff make sense? And the present, you know, a lot of stuff is just highly contingent or some something we're just trying out for a little while or some unstable equilibrium. And I think this sort of 1950s perfect nuclear family leave it to beaver thing is a great example of this. It's like, it seemed very enduring to people in the fifties and maybe it's just an evanescent sort of fad like, you know, hula hooping. And so, um, and so yeah, it's, it's the, the, the future is very weird but the present is equally weird. You know, one of the things I like about your stuff, Noah, is um, you have very unusually, might not be, um, you're comfortable in a very different culture from that of U.S. Uh, Western. You, you're, you're very, you spent a lot of time in Japan, and and it, it's it, you know we, you're talking about you know hit, what history teaches you, which is useful for sci-fi and vice versa, is that things could be different, and of course across even across societies right now, even societies that have access to the same technology, things can be different. I don't know if that's has some bearing on your appreciation of this stuff. Well, it, it really does. It's it was incredibly interesting to live, you know, all those years in Japan, just just four years, but um uh you know, I didn't spend much time around the expat community. So I guess that accelerated my acculturation. Um, but it was it was interesting which things were different and which things are the same. Some things were just incredibly different, uh, like people's entire idea of how, what a city was, where you would live, you know, um, 
you know, the, the spatial relations of everything, uh, what, what kind of job or career you could aspire to have. And then some things were just exactly the same. I mean, of course, you know, uh, Masahisa Fujita, uh, yeah. your co-author. And um, I don't, is he still alive? I hope so. I don't know. You know, I've lost touch with this. Sorry, I, lost, I did yeah. you know, geography with uh, it, uh, some years back. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I knew him well before I knew you, but then like just the, the similarity with which you guys think is kind of notable. <laughs> um, and I thought that was, you know, it's kind of funny. Um, it just, just professors in general in Japan are exactly the same as professors in America culture wise. They're the same people who fit to a very similar institution. Um, and, then some, and then some other things are radically different. And so, um, yeah, it's just, it really gives you a sense of the, of the contingency of a lot of these things. And also this retro futurism, you know, Joe, you were talking about John Bruner, who's really, you know, probably the best futurist that I could think of like pure futurist um, in sci-fi, but then like just projecting all these things out, Japan really feels in many ways like uh, you took the, the world of the New Deal and projected it forward uh, in many ways. And you still have this corporate, you know, welfare state, this, um, you know, social contract, this sort of commitment to egalitarianism while pretending it's, it's the market. Um, and you have, and this sort of this background of like, preparing for a war that there may or may not ever be. Uh, so many things about Japan's uh, economic system and, and society in many ways feel like extrapolations from FDR's New Deal. And of course that's intentional because that in, during the US occupation, Japanese leaders decided, okay, America is the strongest society in the world. Let's copy a bunch of stuff that they do uh, in order you know, to strengthen ourselves. And so that was intentional, but it's anyway, that I thought sometimes other societies can seem almost like retro futurist portrayals of our own. So to, to, go, to go back to what you're saying about the future not making sense in science fiction, which I think is a very interesting point. I think the way that people world build often is that they will have some crazy idea. Okay. Uh, and they're like, okay, I have this, this crazy Ascension elevator. fun idea. Yeah, that's right. But then once I, once I have the crazy fun idea that makes no sense, I will then figure out exactly how that complexly fits into everything else mm -hmm. and the effect that, it, that it'll have. So even though the idea might be a really weird one, uh, then you've worked out all of the implications of it and how it fits in with everything else and the kinds of things that people do and the kinds of institutions that last and all these things we were talking about. So, so that, that is, I think, how it often works. That's certainly how it works for me when, mm. when I'm doing this kind of, kind of world building. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of more thought experiments than uh, sort of exactly forecasting. Yeah, right. Sorry. But Joe, I have a question, Joe. When you when you build worlds, and sorry, Paul, if I'm interrupting. I mean, no, Dad, this interrupting is what this is all about. <laughs> right. Well, I so I, my question is when you when you build worlds, um, when you have like the one cool thing about this new world, or maybe five cool things that you want to really focus in on, and then you need to make a complete world just, uh, you know, you need more stuff than that. You need, you know, suppose you don't really care about what kind of stores people shop in, but then at some point the character needs to go to the store. So you need to have a store in there. Do you find yourself uh, make just sort of pulling modern day analogs and assuming that that part that you don't necessarily care about as much doesn't change? Or do you just, um, or, or do you like, make up some reference to some weird thing and then not in the future and then not explain it or I, I it's embarrassing to say I actually haven't read your books. I haven't read It's 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 fine. Um, and I don't write a lot of science fiction for that exact reason, uh, because you have to stop and figure it all out. Um, I know you do it all ahead, um, but uh, but that is that is a problem that yeah. you've got the thing that you're interested in and the world building that you've done, and then you're like, okay, what are the stores like? That wasn't an implication of any of these things that I've been thinking about. And the worst thing you can do is reach for the present. Yeah. That, is, that is the thing that is always going to be cliched and boring. It, every single time you just go with what you think you know 
and where the present I is. Think, I think the one thing that's worse than that is is leaping for generic dystopia. Um, that too. Uh, yeah, that's because also, we're so saturated with with generic awful. dystopia that that also. Yeah, you know, how does this work? Well, it should be like the present, only more evil. Yeah. Uh, is a very uh, very instinctive yeah. thing that a lot of people reach for and. Again, that just requires thinking a little bit more. So Joe and I, as she mentioned, have opposite world ways of planning a story where I do five years of world building and then six months of outlining and then start. And Joe does, you know, some, some <laughs> planning and starts and, and, and it's the same work done in the opposite order. Uh, people think of it as radically different, but it's actually the same steps done in the opposite order because Joe will go along, get to a thing, think about it, get to a thing, think about it. You know, and then message our friend Jonathan over in, <laughs> uh, at UCLA, who's a Martian astrogeologist, to be like, you know, Jonathan, my character on Mars just sat on a rock. Help. What is the rock like? Uh, whereas I will have two years earlier called Jonathan and grilled him about what rocks on Mars are like for three hours and taken extensive notes on. But the I'm same, sure he appreciates being the go-to guy for Martian rocks for everyone. He, so fun. He's, he's great. great. He's he, fantastic. He's a terrific person. You should listen to our podcast that we did with him yes. um, about, he talks about this. It's about Mars, but also about answering science fiction authors' science questions, yeah. uh, which is itself a skill. Definitely um, a skill. But yeah. when the world building premises that you're starting with are big enough, they are going to touch everything. So if we take Terra Ignota, for example, where the one of the core premises is we have this network of flying cars that are so fast you can get from anywhere else on Earth to anywhere else on Earth in two hours, which socially collapses the Earth into having the level of interconnectivity of a city as and its suburbs in that everything is within commuting distance. Once you've done that, and then you know a lot of my pr primary world building was then about what does this do to politics? What does this do to citizenship? Uh, what does this do to borders? Borders don't make sense anymore, but people might still have political identities, so we have borderless nations. But when they need to go to a restaurant, it's very quick and easy to say, okay, well, it's a restaurant. I can go to any restaurant on earth in two hours. How would that change my choices of restaurants that I would want to go to. Well, I would want to constantly go to these particular good restaurants in odd places that I've been to once. So it would mean that, you know, particularly outstanding restaurants would then probably have waiting lists because people would have to go to them a lot. And so there would be, you know, sort of a queuing up system, but it would also mean that there might be restaurants that only do one meal because they might do dinner all day because people from other time zones might want dinner in what for that restaurant's time zone is breakfast time, but they could develop a really, really great dinner menu. And then they're serving dinner to people who are coming from Japan at a different type of day from when they're serving dinner to people who are coming from Europe, but they're gonna get customers who want dinner at all times. So you can just extrapolate it very quickly from the fundamental couple of premises when your fundamentals are big things that touch all corners of the society. I can't resist yeah. just saying this, um, given Noah's remark about Masa Fujitu, I really need to, I, I'm pretty mm. sure he's, I, I would know if he did, but I haven't talked to him for several years, but academia, uh, well, uh, you might know this as well, Ada, but it's, it's a bit like your Terra Ignata world, where you have mm. affinity groups that are spread everywhere. And I, I used to say, these days I'm a little more uh, Catholic in my connections, but I used to say that I was more likely to talk to an international trade expert in Kyoto than I was to talk certainly to a historian and, the next and, and probably even to the labor economist down the hall. Yeah, well, and indeed, uh, academia slash the EU were in an overlapping way my main model because a lot of what I uh, experience while I was doing that stage of the world building was that I was at a research institute. I was at Harvard's uh, Villa Itati Institute in Florence, which was full of uh, research fellows from all over the world. And there we were in Italy, and there were couples where the father was British and the mother was Australian, and the kids were born in France and had been mostly growing up in Spain, but now they were spending a year in Italy. And what was their social affinity group? Well, it was sort of this academic world of scholarship and scholarliness. And it also meant that I would listen to dinner table conversations where the parents were talking with each other about, okay, you know, here are the five citizenships that our kid might be eligible for. 
which ones have which advantages? Can you have more than one of them or are they exclusive with each other? Which citizenship do we want to strategize to arrange for our kid to have? Oh, this kid was born when you were in the US on a fellowship and we're gonna have another baby. Do we wanna like take a trip there so that the kids have the same citizenship as each other for, you know, and, and, and it was very vexed and complex for the present, which doesn't expect that. The present, which expects you're born in a place that is your political allegiance. But our world has become much more diasporic thanks to easy online communications and the proliferation of travel. And so it very much felt like those conversations amongst a community where the affinity group of that community is spread all over the place, but is a very coherent group with views and needs and citizenship needs for kids uh, could be a model of what a future borderless nation might operate like in which everybody is living like an expat lives at an institute, you know, working with other people when traveling from where they're coming from. Uh, and a lot of my extrapolation about this future of transit and borderless commixing nations where everyone grows up as a minority of surrounded by other minorities and there's no majority uh, was easy to extrapolate from those experiences and then to extrapolate further into the final volume, which people keep commenting on in the context of COVID, because the, you know, I bring this world into a state of crisis and it's a world of diasporic community that is suddenly faced with a state of crisis. And I finished this book in October, 2019. It is a pre-COVID book, yep. but it is out and everyone is saying, it sounds so much like it's, about, I can't, surely this bit you added after, surely this bit you added after. And I just say, no, it came from thinking about what would a crisis do to a community that has the shape that in fact our communities now have, where people are seeing each other spread out around the world, responding to the same set of emergencies and the same set of pressures, while if you made a list of the 50 people who are most important to you, all but a couple of them are not in the city where you are. And Unless that's the York. experience we have. Yeah. <laughs> so what can, social, what can social science learn from this? Because I think that you know, when I look at the way that the social sciences think, there are people certainly, uh, I'm somebody who studies international politics, but people by and large don't study this kind of, these forms of connectivity and how they reshape things or really think about the world as being a structural system in quite that sense. You know, obviously Marxists did this back in the first part of the 20th century, but you know, I can think of people like, say, for example, Adam Tooze, who does it now, people who do mm -hmm. macro finance, but there just isn't all that much in the way of a kind of, you know, looking at big secular change in a systematic fashion on a worldwide basis is not something that is uh, very much in vogue in the social sciences these days. So I kind of wonder if this is something we could learn from science fiction writers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, do it. <laughs> <laughs> the place I do see it is in historians of information technologies, people who work on the dissemination of the printing press, people who work on the development of the first news networks as pamphleteer, uh, pamphleteering became a profession, uh, people who work on the impact of radio arriving or the impact of the telegraph. I think that some of the people who work on that material, like the people that I got together for the some censorship project. I did a project with Cory Doctorow, who works on contemporary information tech and is also a science fiction writer, trying to get together information tech historians with present day information tech people uh, to talk about, okay, in the past there have been information revolutions. What impacts did they have, especially on censorship? Because every time there's a new information tech, there's a consequent wave of efforts to try to control what is said in that new information tech. And, you know, this is, we are not in the first information tech revolution. We're in like the 17th information tech revolution. And we have many earlier information tech revolutions to look at to give us models of how uh, how quickly censorship develops, how different types of censorship, for example, censorship uh, before publication versus censorship after publication, uh, what types of authorities are behind the censorship, how these affect things like uh, how quickly books can be produced, how quickly they spread, uh, how hard or easy it is to regulate uh, and make money, who gets rich, who doesn't get rich, uh, all of these things we have great models of. And it was really wonderful getting those historians together with those tech people um, in that way. I, so, I, I, I have to do a, a friend of mine, Joanne Yates is a 
historian mm-hmm. of business uh, and, and business communication. She has a, a great book about the uh, early uh, development of business communication stuff. Her, her husband calls it history of the memo, but it mm-hmm. talks about all these, that you don't think of as technologies, like the vertical filing cabinet. Mm. It only works along with carbon paper because before that everything had to just be in a single book, but the ability to have separate memos and the difficulty of training people to write memos about just one thing, uh, you know, so all of this stuff. Um, audience, um, so there's a Q&A uh, function and uh, you should start putting stuff in because we will ha- want to start turning to questions soon. And so I'm going to start working through questions, but um, anybody, um, I mean, just to, Henry, um, I mean, the, the, in a way that I would have thought, do, do people in international relations ever, the, you know, we, we operate very much in this world of the, I'm quoting somebody rather, the hard shell Westphalian state, right? The, uh, where, where it is just borders. Do, do you ever speculate? I know big think is probably not that, that not something you can do certainly until after you got tenure, but the, uh, do you uh, uh, think about, you know, other ways that, that, that relations that are uh, global can, can t- take place? And does do either of our authors ha- have anything useful from your point of view and on all of that? Well, I think that we don't in international relations do nearly enough of this. Uh, so I think, I guess, as you say, people do a little bit more after tenure. There is a, one of Jack Vance's novels has a, a thing where people who go crazy in the end are called emeritus. And I kind of feel like, you know, you can go emeritus, <laughs> at a certain point and say all sorts of crazy things and nobody is going to be too worried about it. But we don't have, at least at the moment, a strong sense in international relations of how information technology really reshapes the global structures within which we live. So there are people who wrote about this in the 1950s, 1960s, a guy called Deutsch has some interesting uh, work. But it's something where I think we have just gotten very much embedded in a world where we think about nation states and we think about globalization and interdependence but we don't think about these as being really fundamentally transformative factors in a way that i think uh, science fiction writers like uh, you know ada's book is obviously very much about this you could look at michael older's book uh, you mm-hmm. know Corey doctorow has mm-hmm. uh, a new book which i think is going to be really really uh pretty, it's going to have a big effect in in our thinking about the relationship between the Green New Deal and some of the uh, more unpleasant politics in the United States. Uh, But political scientists don't have, you know, political scientists love science fiction, uh, but we don't, we find we, we, we find it hard to engage in that kind of structured speculation and get away with it in an academic setting without um, sort of, without um, sort of uh, as I say, becoming emeritus. But nation states are themselves fairly new. Yeah. Uh, you know, language groupings aren't, but nation states as a, as a specific thing, the way that we think of them are, are really very new. Oh, very, very recent. Um, and like, like you said, they're changing. Yeah. Uh, and they're not going to be exactly the way that they are in the future. Um, and we have so many historic examples that are actually closer to this than one might think. I've got a wonderful PhD student right now, Brendan Small, who's working on Renaissance Rome. And one of the characteristics of Renaissance Rome is that only 20% of the people in Rome were Roman because it was the seat of the papacy. There were constantly so many diplomatic missions there and ambassadors and priests in training and people who are coming from the king and the entourages of all the cardinals, in addition to the many, 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 many pilgrims that were coming through. So you had a city which had a very strong civic culture and, and Roman pride and tradition in which the what we would call the native citizens of the city is only actually 20% of the population of the city. And, you know, this lasted for a long time. It was a very, I mean, it, I, would, I don't want to call it a stable in the sense of nothing ever went wrong. Lots of things went wrong. It's as red as those road, exploded in fire every five minutes. Um, but it was certainly as stable as we are, is, is one yeah. way to put it, in, in terms of it, it functioned even though it was a dominantly expat society. And we have plenty of examples in the past where, people are being born in an area, but nonetheless being considered citizen of a different area where people are leveraging their citizenship. You know, there's lots of uh, fighting over Josquin de Pré uh, because he, he was born in a 
bit of Burgundy, which changed hands a bunch between France and Germany and Belgium. And over the course of his life, he would constantly claim membership in different bits of that region or claim to be under a different king based on for tax purposes. Uh, when it, whenever it was time for him to pay taxes on his really quite generous salary. Uh, he was gaming citizenship strategically in precisely the same way those EU academic parent couples that I would see were gaming citizenship strategically. We have many real examples of this type of dynamic setting where borders mean something very different and are, and are, and are analyzed very differently. Well, uh, I, I I think if there are two big lessons that I think social scientists have to learn, one of them is what you were saying earlier, which I uh, summarize as being the future finds its own uses for things. And the other is that uh, things that you think are stable as a social scientist almost certainly aren't. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and simply to, to, to rewind time and double check, you know, if I jump 250 years, is this the same or different? Uh, is always a good, yeah. good yeah. metric. Uh, and, you know, going back to some of Noah's comments about Japan, one of the things I think that's really useful is immersing yourself in any time and place that isn't the one you're used to. Yeah. Because any time, no matter what it is, I happen to also work a fair bit on contemporary Japan. And, it, you know, you look at it and you say, oh, interesting. Feminism is doing different stuff at a different speed. And some of the things that it's doing are, we would say, ahead. And some of the things it's doing are, we would say, behind, if you compare it to the U.S., it's not a monolithic bar graph where like, do you have 10 points of feminism or 15 points of feminism? It's a much more fine grain. And you can make that jump, whether it's modern US to modern Japan or whether it's modern US to 250 years ago US or whether it's modern US to Italian Renaissance or, or ancient Rome to modern Rome uh, to just double check with yourself, hey, this worked differently. Uh, there's sometimes questions that I find useful for both world building and as a historian, uh, questions you can you know, imagine that you're using your little Google Maps, tiny yellow man you pick up and that you're dropping him in this science fiction future or on this planet or in this fantasy world or in this particular period in history. One of the really useful things is what has to go wrong for someone to die in a gutter? Uh, because the answers to what has to go wrong for that to happen and what has to go wrong for the different social safety nets that, that society has to prevent it to all fail will be different and incredibly informative uh, at any given time and place. It's a great question. Yeah, you know, uh, because it, from that, and if you're doing the world building, you ask, well, what institutions are in place to keep somebody from dying in a gutter. Uh, if someone's whole family is killed and then the person is just there and is a kid, what institution is expected to solve that problem? What would result in that institution failing? And it's gonna be very different at different moments. And then you can imagine for your science fictional future or for your fantastical world, you know, oh, well, what if there were four different organizations whose job this is and they're each connected with a polytheistic God that is connected with one of the four seasons. And so like, if you're born right on the edge between winter and spring, then, then both the winter and the spring, how you deal with orphans organizations might decide that you're not their problem. And that's a crack you could slip through. Just thinking of the many different cracks that a person can slip through parallel to real ones in our present day where you know, there are parts of uh, UN refugee services that are only available to people who are still in the active danger area. So when I'm in Italy doing research, for example, there are lots and lots of people who are refugees who were led into Italy and are now in a place where they're safe. And then the service has ended and there's nothing to continue helping after the person has arrived in a country whose language they don't know and where the employment would be very challenging. So looking for those social safety net cracks gets you to religion, gets you to ethics, gets you to gender. The genderedness of who is expected to step in in its nurturing role is often something that's very telling about a culture. Do you wanna? Yeah, um, I want to say something slightly different on the, the general thing is that because I write about science fiction books, I, I write as a reader about science fiction books, uh, I often get asked what one science fiction book should somebody, should everybody read or should somebody read? What one book? And it's a ridiculous question because there is no one book that will, that will uh, help. 
uh, that will explain science fiction to you, that will show you the benefit of reading science fiction. Because the benefit of reading science fiction is to read a lot of science fiction, a lot of different science fiction, and then you will see a lot of different science fiction futures. And we won't get any one of those science fiction futures. Unfortunately, we won't even get yours, which I would love it if we got the Terry Gnota future. That was way above par really well. for but, future. Um, Just tell them Dahlgren, just when they say right. that, just make them read yeah, Dahlgren. Yeah. No. Um, can but, I... but, but if you if you read any one science fiction book, no matter how good, it will not give you the thing that reading a ton of science fiction, some of it awful, will mm -hmm. give you, which is the that. idea of different worlds. Yeah, I mean, you'll often, if you read a short story collection of 10 different mediably thought through, but nonetheless different and interesting imagined futures, that might be more rich from the social science point of view than reading the one best science fiction book yeah. ever written if there were such a thing. Yep. Actually, I, I, can I just bring in uh, audience? There were two questions that seemed mm -hmm. relevant to this and, and paired. One of them was which books inspired you? And we don't have much time, unfortunately. And the other is, can are you willing to name any really bad science fiction books and, and why? I like that question, but uh, I'm not sure it's something you really want to go into. They want to see some fights. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know about bad because when 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 I criticize something for being bad, it's usually because there was something great in it that they then like should have done more of and I was excited by. And so it's actually bad because it had the seed of excellence in there. And then I was sad that they, you know, failed to water the plant and it never bloomed. But even that is a form of praise. I'm constantly, uh, because I read a lot of Japanese SF, I'm constantly telling Joe, hey, there was this mediocre science fiction novel, but it had this one great bit in it where X yeah. happened and the, the seed of the idea itself will be exciting. There was uh, a one question that's kind of related, I think maybe along those lines, there was somebody who was saying, do you, how do you feel about what the questioner asked and which I would also notice that, that there seems to be less um, science fiction than science and less, and less in sort of extra, sort of extrapolation of people and, uh, and a lot of the popular stuff is is veering off into fantasy, which is it's okay, but it's uh, and he mentions a you know particular uh, bet noir of mine, which is what what Apple TV has done to Foundation, turning it into a story of, of people with paranormal powers and all of that stuff. Uh, and all of that. They did that. Yes. Oh, you haven't. If you haven't seen it, don't. It's it's. No, I I, I I don't watch fun. TV. Uh, I I just read, but. So, um, that's horrifying. I mean, so in, in terms of actual numbers, there is in fact more science fiction, but there's also more fantasy and there's just more genre stuff being produced generally. And in fact, there's more books being produced generally. And in fact, even with ebooks growing, the number of physical books being produced every year is still going up and up and up and up. So there's a lot of perception of shrinkage and like, oh, I don't see as much SF. But in fact, there's tons and tons of it. It's just that there's so much more of everything else also being produced. Uh, that there's almost less of a, a room in a spectrum of what you glimpse. There's an enormous, we're in, we're in an SF golden age right now in terms of the volume of stuff that's being put out, a lot of it incredibly innovative and a lot of diverse voices and topics that haven't been in it before. So if you aren't aware that we're living in an SF golden age, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, look at the Hugo finalist yeah. packet uh, for this year. And we, we really are in a, in a lot of ways at the moment. Yeah. And also, uh, I mostly write fantasy, in fact. And I think that it is possible to do a lot of interesting stuff within fantasy. That has a lot of science. A lot of yeah. stuff. Yeah, a lot of stuff with social science, a lot of stuff that is thinking about the future and thinking about other ways that the world can be within fantasy. Uh, and that people are people are are doing that. I I don't want to put fantasy down mm. here in in comparison because both of them are about another way the world could work and allow you to ask interesting questions about the other way the world could work. Whether yeah. it's this is a imagined fantasy culture where everything is divided by four seasons and and they take in different groups of orphans, or whether it's you know I'm I'm working on some Viking stuff now and I'm you know was just working on the question of how when a Christian soldier has died in battle and is picked up by Valkyries and taken to Asgard, do the Valkyries like break it to them that they were wrong and that actually Odin and not Christianity is the correct thing? Like, how do you how do you yeah. lubricate the social awkwardness of that yeah. of that moment? Which is a very interesting 
society, tenderness, respect, multicultural question that you're asking through a and, fantasy premise. And uh, at the beginning, you, I think I haven't updated my biography because you said my most recent book was Lent, whereas in fact, my most recent book, my <laughs> 2020 book, uh, is called All What You Will. Uh, and it's a fantasy novel about death. Uh, and in many ways, it is looking at where death is in our culture, uh, which could not be more social science mm. way, but within a fantasy frame that lets me look at it in, in interesting ways and examine it in different ways yeah. that, I, that I couldn't really in any other way. So in many ways, it matters less whether something is science fiction or fantasy than it matters what kind of questions the author is asking in the story and using that world to tell. Is this yeah. a power fantasy? Is this a coming of age fantasy? Is this a examination of the effect of transit on human societies? You can yeah. do any of those three as science fiction or as fantasy. If you want to be asked to what point to what's bad, though, we're, we're in a glut of badly thought through dystopia, which I kind of hinted at, but the, the let's come up with a science fiction premise. Okay, now let's think about how elites or governments can use it to oppress people uh, and to then take the world building no further. And there is so much of that type of dystopia being produced. To give you the sense of it, I asked a couple of years ago, the head of our university's creative writing program, what portion of your students are writing genre fiction? You know, you have the students in the creative writing program, what are they writing? Uh, you know, what per percentage of them are writing science fiction or fantasy or something? He said, oh, 80 to 90% of all of them are writing near future dystopia. Oh. Not, not just of the ones writing genre, but of all the creative writing students, period, were writing Hunger Games type near future dystopia, single premise, X has turned evil, how are people oppressed by it? And that's not a fruitful direction because no invention in the history of the world has ever been used exclusively for evil. Uh, they've always been used for a variety of purposes. Yeah. Uh, and, and more importantly, the people who are doing oppressing with the technology, which is a totally valid thing to be exploring, usually, Real historical bad guys don't believe that they are bad guys. They believe yeah. that they are doing something that is good, whether they think that it's good just because they think that them and their family should stay in power, uh, whether they think that they are you know, oppressing people who deserve to be de oppressed, whatever it is. You know, real people aren't Orwell's O'Brien uh, laughing because he's going to stamp an iron boot in the face of humanity forever. That type of psychology is incredibly rare. Most of the oppression and damage that's done in real history, like the Inquisition, which I spent a lot of time studying, the Inquisitors sure didn't think they were bad guys. <laughs> they sure thought they were doing a good thing. And so to develop a realistic and interesting, how can this go wrong, that's telling and reflective of real world culture, you need a, why do these people think they're doing the right yeah. thing? And what are the plural ways that this thing is being used? And then how is it going wrong? I more often say this about characters, but it's also true of this. Give things the virtues of their flaws. Mm. Uh, it's, it, it might be a really bad thing, like the Inquisition, but it will have the virtues of its flaws. They will think that they are doing it for a reason carry it through right because battling them and getting them to stop is harder right it's a lot harder to get people to stop a thing when they think it's good uh you don't just blow up the evil tower and the bad guy is gone you have to address the impulse that made people do the oppressive right. thing which but, is a more complex story to tell and gets us a richer and more social science that's it. the inquisition had uh laboratories to test yes. things uh, to make sure that what they were publishing yep. was truth in, in the wake of science. In the, in the wake of Galileo, this is something that one of our recent graduates works on. In the wake of Galileo, the Inquisition uh, and officers who worked for it decided that if they wanted to give accurate uh, answers about whether science was right or wrong, they needed to double check the experiments. And they, so they set up the largest and best funded experimental research laboratory in 17th yeah. century um, Europe in Rome to, to peer review people's science for the Inquisition. And that's the virtue of the Inquisition's <laughs> flaw, right? Yeah, they discovered that you're like, really? <laughs> what, what, what? Because again, uh, real world doesn't have to be plausible. <laughs> and uh, isn't. So true.
<laughs> Nobody expects, expects a defense of the motives of the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> um, uh, this was the Roman Inquisition, not the Spanish Inquisition. The Spanish okay. Inquisition allowed not defend Maybe for motives, better, but, but they do think that they are good guys, and that's the harder, more challenging villainy to take on that makes for a richer and meatier uh, narrative. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, I don't think we actually have time for anything more. Uh, any 30 second last words? From you guys? <laughs> yeah, we we, we talked a lot. Anybody except, uh, <laughs> but no, it, I mean, it, it, I, I don't really think there's, there, uh, oh, let me just ask the last question. We, I'll yeah. spend this a, a minute or two past. Uh, one question what audience member, which I thought was actually really good was, how much do you, the, the authors feel constrained by the audience's expectations? Because I, I, as academics, there there are very sharp limits on you know where you can go because you even if you may think mm. of stuff, but you know you know it's not gonna it's not gonna work. It's not gonna get uh, cited. Yeah, so some things are a very hard sell for the audience that you know are going to be reading the book certainly, and there are things that if you want to go there, if you want to do that, you've really got to set it up properly so that they'll uh, they'll come with you. And that it takes a lot of work. Yeah, I mean, if, I think of it very much as audience isn't expectation isn't a a a limit. It isn't a cage within them with within which I'm working. It is something that I am cultivating slowly and building up. Uh, it's a vine that I have planted and that I am watering and tending, and I'm guiding where it's growing, and I'm making them care more about this, and I'm making them have this question and I'm making them wonder whether this will happen. I'm making them think a lot about this character at once so they won't be thinking about this other thing so that I can suddenly refer to it later. Uh, audience expectation is one of the most important things that a novel is, is, is growing uh, and is shaping as you advance so that when a major moment comes, you get that feeling of, ah, yes, of course, it has to flow from the thing that happened just as in a cozy mystery the mystery writer has been giving you the clues bit by bit so that when it comes together with the detective in the accusing parlor everything feels right that's something that you've built not something that you're constrained by and if you build it well you can bring in just about anything uh, you just have to earn it i wish we had scheduled this for 90 minutes instead of 60 <laughs> I think we are i think we I actually have thought we did What's that? I thought we did until like very recently. No, it, it's uh, a yeah. sorry. Okay, so um, uh, yeah. Um, all I can say is, uh, wow. I wish we could go on, but I think we do need to uh, to wrap it up. And can I say just thank you to all? This has been really fun, and maybe ne next year in person or next. Yeah. Year. Yes. Yes. Let's, yes. Absolutely. Let's do yeah. it again. Let's do it for, <laughs> for our, yeah. Let's do this live. Up. The life of the mind and the heart of the city, which is the, the Graduate Center's motto. So let, let's hope we can do that. Fantastic. Okay, guys. Thank you, Thanks everybody. So thank you all. Thank, thank, you, thank you for having us. Take care. Thank you.